Okay, so uh, I had enough prepared for two hours. Got reduced to about 45 minutes, down to 20 minutes, and now we have 10. So uh, that's good by me. I, I, I like upper class on planes, it's fine. Okay, so yeah, I won't even introduce the title of the talk because that'll take up a minute of my allocation. So instead, basically I'm gonna talk about microservices, why you should bother with them, what you can tell the business people, if they're not here, about how to use these things, or where you, what you might consider, if you are the business person, why you might consider using this strange esoteric term called microservices. Okay, so who am I? I am a chief scientist. I gave myself this role, I'm very proud of it. It basically is an excuse not to be a CEO or a CTO. It means I ha don't have to fill out any spreadsheets ever. Okay, that means I get to do other important things like code and uh, deliver systems and work with clients and have fun. So I've got the best job on the planet. So just to give you an idea of the popularity of microservices, and clearly because I have so much time to speak, I'm gonna take you on a quick tour of my next day. The, uh, to give you an indication of just how many people are interested in this subject, I'm gonna fly to London in about three hours time. And then when I hit London, I'm gonna be then moving to the Olympic Park where I'm giving a talk to a slightly larger audience than this on the same subject. The jet lag's gonna be awesome. I'm then going to North London again to do another talk like this. And then finally I get to get back to Heathrow, grab my car and drive two hours to my house. So, um, you know, this is good. And that's at least two minutes of my talk done. So, <laughs> okay, so what's, what is this all about? What's the next 10 years look like for you? Okay, so in the next 10 years, I can tell you what it's not gonna be about. That's usually the easier approach. It's not gonna be about, um, it's not gonna be about agility. <laughs> okay, I searched agility, this is what I found. Um, you're not gonna be worrying about agility. Agility is not gonna be your competitive advantage on its own. So I don't think that's the problem anymore. It's not even gonna be about clouds so much. Uh, hopefully these terms will start to move into the background and be the commodity they should be. And it's probably not gonna be about PaaS, um, which are color tablets apparently. I mean, who knew, a whole conference for a color tablet. Uh, so, you know, it's not gonna be about that, it's gonna be about what we can do, and it's gonna be a something, something much more important to what we're doing today and what we're gonna be doing very soon. It's gonna be innovation, which is a horrible term, and an awful lot of people misunderstand what it's supposed to be, but I think a lot of businesses are getting their heads around that in order to succeed and to move forward quickly enough and to beat the competition, they're gonna to need to innovate rapidly and successfully. To put them outside the, cla the uh, crowd a little bit and to turn their shareholders from this <laughs> into happy people. Okay, so what's the problem then? Hey, innovation, we've been doing it for years. Why are we uh, even considering new approaches to doing this? The problem is you're dead already. Every company here might be dead already. That's a negative start, isn't it? Um, that's not winning you, I can tell. Not dead yet, good, good. I should have put yet on it. <laughs> I'm not saying you have to be dead. <laughs> I'm just saying you're probably dead. Um, the reason you're probably dead is because you may not, particularly if you're a large beast, you're not able to innovate quickly enough for the smaller beasts that are snapping at your heels. It's an old story, and it's still as relevant today as it has been for years, but interestingly enough, it's getting worse. You see, things, things are evolving constantly, and things are changing, and our software isn't keeping up. The systems we build are built on a, a very strange philosophy from over 2,000 years ago, which is that there is a perfect ideal, and in the, if we ever hit that, we will never need to change the system. I haven't met one of those systems yet, but I'm, I'm assured they exist, because when I used to do waterfall development, that was what we spent our lives doing, was trying to build perfection. So the problem is, these days, we're not doing waterfall development, are we? We're doing agile. We're all agile software people. Um, but unfortunately, our software isn't. Our software is still being primarily built with this assumption, this architectural philosophy that perfection is achievable. And it's that that we need to fight against. Okay, because the ship may be large, but it's sinking. Sorry. <laughs> You can be the biggest, the baddest, even the best, but you may well be sinking and not know it. 
You may even have your eyes closed and be enjoying the prowl. See, I just threw these slides in because I knew you'd already just eaten lunch. This will keep you awake. Um, yeah, you may be, may be feeling really good about things right now, but tomorrow is looking a little more bleak because of these sorts of things. No, not icebergs. I mean monoliths. I mean the software that you have, the huge monolith beasts that you have to shove forward in horrible escapades of hundreds of DevOps people forcing these fat things forward. Okay, so this is what we want to watch out for. And this is the quote that I found that scared me, let alone anyone else, which is that essentially this is why you're dead. <laughs> Even if you're really good at things, you're probably dead. Um, but you don't have to be, okay? The thing is, when you think about it, that's someone thinking, not anything else. Uh, <laughs> when you think about it, we don't need a bigger boat, okay? We don't need a bigger monolith. That isn't the answer, because unfortunately a lot of people think that. What well, they think is we need bigger systems. The natural condition for the future is bigger, badder, better, horrible to work with. It's not the case. We don't, we don't need bigger teams. We don't need bigger, <laughs> we don't need bigger governance. All of these things, organizations are already reducing to the point where they're competing with you and you're in danger. So we definitely don't need the ultimate in governance, which is, I know you want to move things forward, but not today. Um, we don't want that. We can't have that. Others haven't got it, and they're going to beat us. We, <laughs> we definitely don't need SOA. <laughs> Um, I get in trouble for this one because a lot of people are still debating our microservices, service-oriented architectures. I'd like to put the whole thing to bed. No one cares. Okay. I don't think it's important. What's important is what we can do with these things. Um, so yeah, we don't want to reinvent OSGI and all the, uh, all the other amazing things that can go into building a greater and larger monolith. What we want to do is enable innovation. And for the first time, I think, in the industry, we've actually got an architectural style that supports it, which is this idea of microservices. Not a great term, but it's, it's there, it's ready to use. Where innovation happens, it kind of happens about there. Once you've got chaos and stuff happening, eventually it starts to narrow out before it gets obvious and clear what we're doing. Okay? This is what I call uh, the stoic bridge in software development. Our philosophy should not be platonic and going for perfection. We need to become stoics and assuming that we don't know what's going to happen. The famous phrase from Seneca was that the next hour is not promised you. Think about that on an organizational level. OK, so what do we need? This, we, need we need Darwinian selection, of which this is a good example. <laughs> Darwinian selection, this is the short, short version of this talk. It gets worse than this um, in the long one. So the idea is that we need some mechanism whereby we can try. We need to be able to try and evolve systems quickly and allow the system to almost evolve and emerge to it on its own, under its own forces. Um, so kind of more like natural selection. And this is what I've seen in the systems I'm working with. They're using microservices, which I'll define in detail in a moment, just before I flee the stage. But what they, the important thing that we get from these systems is not the fact that we're labeling things as microservices. We get the ability for individual parts of our system to compete with one another. Yes, project management, that means we sometimes do the same thing twice. But that sometimes means we do it better the first time. But that's, a, that's okay. <laughs> well, at least we tried. Okay, so natural selection is an incredibly important part of innovation because you want to be trying. You want to be encompassing things and actually finding out actually that was better. Hmm, who knew? Okay, what it doesn't need <laughs> is a lot of effort. Bizarrely enough, microservices are so simple. The annoying thing about labeling them as SOA is it turns something simple into something uh, blurry and complex, which is why I resist the idea. So we don't have to try hard to do this. We do have to think slightly differently, but we don't have to put a lot of effort in. And the best thing is, you guys are at a Cloud Foundry conference. You may not have realized this. But at a Cloud Foundry conference, with a PaaS, a microservice, you need a PaaS for microservices because it takes a lot of the headache away from you. If you saw the talk yesterday by Matt, he was talking about those inhibitors to adopting microservices. Well, innovation is the reason we want to do it. Microservices are the mechanism, the architectural style, 
And in fact, without, they come with their baggage, they come with their problems, you need a PaaS to take those problems away. So there's a lovely message here of, if you want to sell Cloud Foundry, use microservices. <laughs> okay, right. Why do we do all this? Because then great things happen. Okay, I'm not suggesting for a moment that the, the Moon program was a microservice-based architecture and evolving system. But it was certainly a, a degree of reaction to events. Um, the idea is that if we do these things, great things do happen. And we do have plenty of examples in our industry right now of these things happening. And these companies are scaring the life out of other companies. It's a stock example. I know with very good authority that there are several very large companies in Europe who are terrified of these guys. And that's crazy, because these guys are tiny <laughs> compared to them. But these guys can innovate in ways that these other incumbents can't. The interesting thing is I work with the incumbents to try and help them. But so at least they're realizing there's a challenge. So what do we need to do? What do I suggest you take away and do? First of all, stop thinking in, in terms of boulders. You're not building bigger pieces of software. Please don't. Um, instead, don't even think of rocks. That's your SOA. That's OK. But the problem with rocks is, once again, you're building things that don't embrace the key thing you need to embrace in your architecture, which is change. Agile software, adaptable software, needs to be able to change. The bigger the rock, the more it will resist change. So what we want are pebbles. This is your microservices metaphor. Lots of little pebbles that can be shoved along at their own paces and allowed to do their pebble things. All right, yeah, the metaphor's not brilliant. But it's what I'd like you to think of. OK, so this is microservices in a nutshell. I don't know how much time I've got, but I've got almost nothing. They are small. Well, yeah, it's micro. That's obvious. Um, they are single purpose. That's quite helpful. That's where the simplicity comes in. One service does one very small thing. Could be a function. People get upset about this. They can't start saying, we don't want to build nano services because we need another term. Not important. What is important is how, how fast areas of your system need to change. Make the pieces small enough to support the change. Fred Brooks is still influencing this industry. He's pointing out every time you do a ripple for your software, bad things happen. Everyone got an IDE here? Whenever you do a refactoring, and then you have to check, yeah, you do one small change, and you have to check in 40 files, Fred Books would have a moment with you. That's not refactoring, that's a ripple. Okay? We have the same thing at the architectural level. So, single purpose is useful, size less so. For goodness sake, let's not talk about SLOC. A lot of people in the industry talk about SLOC as a, as a defining size for microservices. I don't care, really. It's single purpose, and the interesting thing is you can, as long as you have the right level of granularity, your system can evolve. Okay, they are simple. They are polyglot. This is an interesting one. You can build using any framework you like, any language you like. Choose for simplicity. Make it objective. Pick whatever you like. The, the smart guys on the Cloud Foundry team will support it eventually. You know, it's, it's, it's there to be done. And think in terms of pipelines. This is a fundamental difference between SOA and microservices. In a microservices architecture, you're not building hierarchies of abstraction. You're building lots of little peer services that manifest pipelines and data flows. Believe it or not, I don't have time to tell you why this is so powerful now, but that is really the thing that enables the innovation I'm talking about. Because each, now we have options, right? Microservices give us options. Each microservice can evolve at its own rate, and it also can scale at its own rate. If you've ever attempted to scale a monolith, or to put it back to its metaphor, scale a boulder, it's pretty hard, usually painful. Scaling microservices can almost be a system condition and something not even handled by you. And that's a good thing, because if you've got hundreds of them, you don't want to be thinking about it. You get options, as I say, you can have multiple options of the same functionality available at runtime. We talk about failover a lot between microservices because there are a lot of potential points of failure. Well, the reason you offset this is you have the ability to fail over between them. And the last thing I'll leave with you is a, a lovely esoteric term that I think is brilliant for describing the system we want. When you build a system out of microservices, you want anti-fragile systems. 
Okay, has anyone heard of the term anti-fragile? Anyone out there in the dark? Okay, so for those who've never heard of it, read the book Anti-Fragile. Just go and do it. The main point of it is there's a triad involved. You've got fragile, you've got robust, and you've got anti-fragile. Okay, we all know what fragile systems look like. If anyone's ever tried to boot Windows, no, I'm, oh, I know, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Seriously, it's been a long time since I've had to even do it. Um, the, uh, we all know what robust systems look like, resilient systems. This is what we're sold a lot by a lot of frameworks. Make it robust, make it resilient. At best, a robust and resilient system will ignore change. At worst, it will resist it. So the danger with robust and resilient systems is you're wrapping a fragile system with many, many layers that will need to be somewhat removed in order to change it. So I tend to push people towards anti-fragile systems. The best way of characterizing this is a system that benefits and thrives on stress. The stress of change, the stress of runtime, the stress of success, the stress of failure. All of these things, if you build an anti-fragile system from microservices, you start to thrive upon. You don't avoid these stresses, you get better with them. Look at Netflix's Simeon Army. It's an implementation of stresses on their system. It forces the system to improve. That's the thinking. Let's build anti-fragile software, because not only will we be able to change faster, innovate faster, but we'll also be able to handle runtime conditions better, and maybe even improve on them. OK. And lastly, it's a deployment and management challenge, to fair to say, with microservices. And that is where the beauty of Cloud Foundry comes in. The beauty of PaaS, to be fair. There's an awful lot of non-functional conditions that you want to consider, including those anti-fragile concerns I was mentioning. Well, it becomes a platform concern. And I, I'm hoping that the roadmap for many of the uh, platform as a services that are being built at the moment, including this particular one, are all going to begin to think about anti-fragility in microservices in this way, because if the platform can handle it, all you've got to do is build very, very simple microservices to do one single thing, and your productivity goes through the roof. Okay, because you can experiment and change, and you can beat the competition. So just to finish on a negative message, your competitor is probably doing this. Um, and if they aren't doing it, they're probably going to phone me up at some point and ask me to help them do it. So I, I advise you to think about it. OK, microservices is a buzz term. But anti-fragility and in thriving on change and innovating because you can do those things is real. And that's the thing we enable. We get it with microservices. And Cloud Foundry as a platform takes away many of the non-functional problems with taking the approach on. OK, so where to next? It's a flashcard session. There's a conference in London, uh, if anyone happens to get over there in November, which is the first conference in the world, I think, on microservices and anti-fragile software systems. If you can make it, you'd be very, very welcome. I promise to buy everyone beer. Not in this room. There's quite a few here. Um, anti-fragile, and I've got to go to the airport, I'm sorry. Uh, anti-fragile software, the book, there's 50% off it. I think I'm kind of like, yeah, 50% off it, which is $13.99. That's not, that wouldn't even buy you a glass of wine in the pub. I know, because I bought two, and it was $36. It's good wine, but my goodness. Um, OK, so it's a, it's a cheap option. It's $13.99. To grab it, it's a work in progress. But everything I'm talking about becomes very concrete in this book as I rattle it in. OK? And finally, this is, this is us. We're probably the, one of the few companies in the world that has advised many different clients and taken them through the full life cycle of build, building microservice-based systems. I've only given you a snippet today. I'm sorry, I only have so much time, which I've vastly gone over. But there's, uh, there's amazing things that we can talk about and help you do, and maybe stop you being one of those dinosaurs that gets killed by the meteor. OK, so thank you very much for your time. I hope it's been at least a little bit more upbeat straight after lunch. I'm going to pass over to the people who've been very, very kind to give me some time to actually do this now before I fly. And uh, please stay in touch. Thank you very much. Thank you.